you want to get a head start over there. A um, couple of things, though. One that I want you to help me uh, just celebrate with and praise God with. We had uh, one of our teens that was baptized last Wednesday over at Cross Ministries. Um, he's actually here. I won't embarrass him by making him stand up, uh, but he's, he's back in this area. Um, his name's Raymond, and he, he was baptized on Wednesday. Oh, there he goes. There he is. Right there. So he was baptized Wednesday, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about him. He didn't know that um, today, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about him at the end of the service today. But I just wanted to let you guys be aware of that and to praise God with us. And then also just some updates from uh, Cross Ministries and Main Street. Um, most of you know we have services over there every Sunday morning at 1045, but we have also just recently added kind of a Bible study fellowship discussion time uh, before uh, worship. It starts at 945. And so things are going well over there. They're growing or moving um, and that kind of thing. And so I just wanted you to be aware of that. So again, you can uh, praise God for the work he's doing over there. And if you ever want to join us, uh, I wouldn't want you to miss out on that, that time as well. So 1 Kings chapter 8. To catch you up before we start reading here, we're going to start in verse 22. 1 Kings chapter 8, we have already gone through Moses, we've gone through Joshua, we've gone through the judges, we've gone through Saul, David, and now we're on to Solomon. And Solomon at this point has just completed the building of God's temple. And if you remember the story of Israel from Moses on, from Egypt on, you know up until this point that they've done nothing but wander. Um, and they've wandered around the wilderness, they've wandered around the desert, and they're constantly moving. Some of that was due to punishment because they didn't trust in God enough. And other parts of it was just the natural reaction of them trusting in God and in the course that he planned out. And they were just conquering nation after nation after nation because God had promised them a certain land. And so up until this point, they're just, they've been constantly on the go and they're moving. And so if you could put yourself in Israel's place for just a moment, you could imagine what this means for this temple to have been completed. And we're going to hear Solomon's prayer, at least some of it, as he prays how he feels, uh, and I believe how the Israelites were feeling as well. But if we put ourselves in their place, we've been constantly moving from generation to generation, either moving, again, out of just punishment because we didn't trust God, or, or we're overtaking nations, and we're moving into this land and that land, and always on the go. And God is the same way. He's been on the go with us the whole time. And so he comes down, and when he's with us, he comes down this huge uh, cloud of smoke, or he leads us by a pillar of fire, either one. And so he comes down, and he, we can see his presence, and then he removes it from us. And then he comes down, and he's physically with us, and then he removes. And so what this temple means is God's never going to leave again. That he's going to stay firm and planted right in the midst of us, or the Israelites. And so starting at verse 22, Solomon's going to pray this prayer of dedication. And he's going to set this temple up as they've just completed it. Uh, for God to come and dwell in it. So it says, Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel, spread out his hands toward heaven, and said, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised, and with your hand you have fulfilled it as it is today. Now, Lord, the God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, the promises you made to him when you said, You shall never fail to have a successor to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your descendants are careful in all they do to walk before me faithfully as you have done. And now, God of Israel, let your word that you promised your servant David, my father, come true. But will God really dwell on earth, the heavens, the, on earth, the heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you? How much less this temple I have built? And so you can see Solomon's humility as he stands before God. And he has arms outstretched. And he's praying this dedication. And he's saying, fulfill your promises, God. And I praise you because you already have. But how in the world can you dwell in a temple that we've made here on earth? Not, not even the heavens can contain all of who you are. How can you possibly come dwell in this temple? And so I want you to see, first of all, how we're going to get to how this relates to us. But... Picture, again, Israel. God has never been fully with them all the time because of their sin or this sin and this movement and that movement. And now they're thinking, how in the world is he going to stay firmly planted in this temple that we built? 
when even his own heavens can't contain him. And so I want you to see verse 23, because that's the condition. God's going to stay firmly planted here on one condition. It says, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way. And you see, that wholeheartedly, that's the key to all of us, but the key to God staying in his temple and dwelling among Israel. If you've read any length of time in the Old Testament and read much of the story just continually through, um, or if you have a really good memory and can remember as you break it up, um, but you'll, you'll notice as you read, uh, starting from the beginning all the way up to this point, that God talks about wholeheartedly serving or loving him, or things like love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And God talks about it over and over through these stories, through Moses, through Joshua, through Judges, through the kings. He says, love me, serve me, follow my commands wholeheartedly or with all your heart. And we know with Israel, they do this a lot, and then a lot of times they give away part of their heart. And it's over and over this cycle of having a good leader and following him to that leader going away, and they just start doing their own thing. And this and that and this and that. And they, they slowly give pieces of their heart and pieces of their trust away, whether it's to other gods or just to their own desires or whatever it is. And they slowly give it away. And every time they do, God leaves the camp and he gives them over to their enemies. And so God's been telling them from the beginning, and Solomon echoes it here in his prayer, if, I, if we'll serve you wholeheartedly, then stay with us like you promised. He goes on in 1 Kings 8, and lists all the different reasons or different situations that the Israelites might find themselves in by not serving God wholeheartedly. And he says, whenever your people are taken over by other enemies and they go to war and they go to uh, and other enemies capture them because they sinned against you, when they turn back, God, come back to us, forgive us and heal us. He says, whenever we've sinned and you stop the rain and you send famines or plagues, um, or sicknesses, whatever it is, when we turn back to you, God, when we serve you wholeheartedly again, then come back to us, dwell in the temple, dwell among us, and, and forgive us of our sins. Skip down to verse 41. I think most of us would agree with the, with the scriptures and with the saying that God never changes, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I think most of us would agree with that. But if you're like me, when you think about God in the Old Testament and God in the New Testament, it's like two totally different gods almost, because the God in the Old Testament is so fierce, and he's so to the point, and you, get a, you do what he says or you die, and, you, and if you do what he says, you live, and it's so immediate consequences, it's so immediate judgment, and he's just sending his people out to this point, just constantly overtaking other nations, um, and it doesn't seem like there's much room for hey, you guys want to come worship at the temple with us today? <laughs> uh, to, the, to the foreigners or to the non-Christians. And so God in the Old Testament toward God in the New Testament with Jesus seems very different. But I want you to know, if you don't already, if you haven't spent some time looking, God in the Old Testament is the same exact God of the New Testament. And the way I like to look at it is, I like to read the Old Testament looking for Jesus before Jesus. And what I mean by that is, there's all kinds of teachings that God set up. There's all kinds of characters in the Old Testament that do the exact same things Jesus taught and did well before Jesus actually came to dwell on this earth. And so I want you to see that this temple that they set up and the way God says, I'm going to dwell among you, applies perfectly to us today. So 41, uh, starting on 41, Solomon says, As for the foreigners... Who does not belong to your people, Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name. For they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you. As do your own people, Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. And so you see, even though God has sent his people out time and time again to destroy these enemy nations, there are still a, there's still a chance... For people to come to his temple, to where he's at, and pray to him. And Solomon says, lift them up, do whatever they ask, because your name will be glorified through it. And so God's seeking these people. Skip to verse 46. He's talking about all people here. 
when they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. That should sound pretty familiar to you. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Solomon says it first. No one doesn't sin. Everyone sins. And you become angry with them and give them over to their enemies who take them captive to their own lands, far away or near. And if they have a change of heart in the land where they have held, are held captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors and say, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all their heart and soul in the land of their enemies who took them captive and pray to you toward the land you gave their ancestors, toward the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then from heaven your dwelling place, hear their prayers and their plea and uphold their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Forgive all the offenses they have committed against you and cause their captors to show them mercy. For they are your people and your inheritance, whom you brought out of Egypt, out of the iron smelting furnace. So you see, even before God sends Jesus, when he sets this temple up, he sets it up as an opportunity for all people to stay wholeheartedly connected to him and to stay, and, and for a way to come back to him if they ever sin and go away. You don't have to turn over there. You can uh, go back and read it on your own time. But 2 Samuel 14, 14, says, the, the second half of that verse says, God devises ways so that a banished person may not remain banished from him. It says God seeks for ways to bring people back to him. Anybody that's sinned and fallen off, he seeks out ways to bring them back. And so ultimately he does it here in the Old Testament with this temple. And he says, I will dwell here if you serve me wholeheartedly and completely. And I will stay here right among you. If you fall from me, if you'll turn back, I'll bring you right back here to where I dwell and where I am. So, what does that mean for us? Because if you're like me, it's kind of hard to put myself in Israel's place. Because again, their lifestyle and my lifestyle were very different. Uh, I can't even imagine what it would look like. Some of these stories and some of these battles of, of thousands and, and hundreds of thousands of, of people marching to battle uh, with thousands of chariots and, and horses. I, I can't even imagine what that would look like and be like in a, and to have that as your lifestyle to, to go out and conquer the way God had them conquering. And so it's hard for me to put myself in their place. But in Matthew 24, you can turn over there, hold your place in 1 Kings, um, we're going to come back to it. Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the end of times, and he's talking about what is, what's going to happen and how the end of, last day is going to come, the fact that nobody knows the hour. And he sets it up talking about a, a house and a, and a thief. And he says in, in verse 42, he says, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let this house be broken into. If we look at this scripture, and Jesus talking about when he's going to return, and it's going to be like a thief in the night. If we take this scripture and go, well, nobody knows when Jesus is coming, and it's all about the time, then I think we've missed the whole point of what Jesus is saying. Because see, it's not about the fact of when the thief will come, the point is, there is a thief. Like, that's the point. There is a thief. And so what are you going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? The Israelites, as they grew up under the Lord, and as they marched through the land, and as they did all the things they did, if you read later on in 1 Kings after this, after Solomon's time has passed, there just becomes king after king after king after king. And they set themselves up, or God lets them raise up, and so on and so forth. And after Solomon, for the longest time, they're just a bunch of wicked kings, and they do things bad, and, and it's just like they're outdoing each other on being the worst king ever, or the most evil king ever, and so they just go bad, 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 bad. Well, eventually, good kings come back up, and it says they, even some of them will say they serve God with all their heart, but they left the high places up, and they may have gone through and, and destroyed all the idols, they may have destroyed all the tabernacles or tents of, uh, for the foreign gods that had come into play, but they left these high places up, and those high places were where they offered sacrifices to the foreign gods. And so it's like, why would you do that? Why would you leave something that you know is only for another god? You can't take it and worship God on it. It was for a different god, but they do it, and they leave it up, and eventually the people go right back to worshiping the false gods on those high places. Jesus says, there's a thief. I want you to think about what your thief is or what your high place is. 
Because I think we all have it. And as Solomon pointed out, as Paul points out, nobody is without sin and everybody sins. And if you follow the course of Israel, which is our story, if we follow Israel, we do kind of this. And we go toward God and then we come back to our own stuff. And we go toward God and then we're robbed again by the thief or the high place that we leave up. So what's your high place? What's your thief that you're not preparing against? You see, Jesus says, nobody knows when the thief's coming. But if I told you today a thief will rob your house, it's, it's coming to your house sometime in the future, what would you do? Probably go home and order that security system you hadn't ordered, right? Like, you would immediately do something to defend your house. Just like if we get news reports that say your neighborhood's being targeted by thieves, or they're targeting this type of car, or this and that. We immediately defend. It doesn't matter when they might attack or when they might come. It's just the fact that they're out there. So Israel failed over and over again by not understanding that the thief was there regardless of when it might come. And they left high places in place. They left thieves in place. So what are our thieves? What's your thief or what's your high place? Turn over to 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20. Because this is where it gets really real for us, and it becomes real personal for us. Because whether you can put yourself in Israel's place with the temple or not, it's about to become right here with us right now. So 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 through 20. It says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Go back and read, if you haven't already, what it takes Solomon to build his temple. He builds this temple for, for God, and the price that he spent is unreal. Tons and tons of money. He Tons of gold, tons of silver, jewels from all over, lumber from all over, all over the world. He's bringing the best in. He spent an incredible price to build that temple. Our temples were bought at a price that trumps that uh, like you couldn't believe. We were bought with such a price, with Jesus' own blood, with him se uh, separating himself from God. We're not our own. We're God's temple. God said he will remain in the temple as long as his people serve wholeheartedly. If they don't give any small piece away, no matter what it is, even like Achan, if you remember the story of Achan, Achan did exactly what God said. He went with the army. He helped destroy the enemy. He, he, he took over the entire town. But God said, don't take anything. And he couldn't help it. He took one small part of his heart, and he took a little bit of stuff and brought it back to his tent. The moment he stopped serving God wholeheartedly, God left him. And Achan and his whole family ended up being punished for it and, and wiped off the earth for it. But if we stay wholeheartedly connected to God, God stays in the temple. He won't leave it. He'll stay right there. So God's in each and every one of us. So we're the temple of God. So protect against those thieves and protect against those high places. Whatever it is that you've allowed from the world to stay in your life, we've got to get rid of because God demands wholeheartedness. If you're not back in 1 Kings 8, flip back over to 1 Kings 8. I want to leave you here with the end of Solomon's prayer. Solomon prays this prayer, and then he gathers all the people together, and he's praying over the people and the temple. We're going to start in verse 56. It says, Praise be to the Lord who has given a rest to this people Israel, just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us nor forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him to walk in obedience to him and keep the commands, decrees, and laws he gave our ancestors. And may these words of mine, which I have prayed before the Lord, be near to the Lord, our God, day and night, and that he may uphold the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel according to each day's need, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is no other. And may your hearts be fully committed to the Lord our God, to live by his decrees and obey his commands as, is, as at this time. Some of your versions in that verse 61, he looks at the people and he says, and remember, remember to stay fully committed. Remember, you have to be fully committed to God. But Solomon wraps up this prayer and he ends up this prayer and dedication to the temple by saying, God, keep your promises to stay with us if we'll keep our promise to stay, co to stay wholeheartedly connected to you. And he says, and if we'll do that, 
then all the people of the world will know that you are the only God. If you fast forward to the New Testament, Paul tells Timothy the same thing. He says, persevere in your teachings and in your doctrine and in your life because it'll save you and all those who hear you. Uh, Peter says the same kind of thing, that love covers a multitude of sins. That if we'll love each other enough, if we'll love God wholeheartedly, if we'll stay persevering in our life as his temple, then we'll not only save ourselves, but we'll save the foreigners or the non-Christians. The world will know that God is God. And the only God. Raymond, baptized on Wednesday, Raymond uh, likes to write songs and write, writes lyrics. And as soon as he got home, he wrote a song about his new life in Christ. And the first line he put on it was, tell the world. Because you see, to, to Raymond, his baptism was meant two things. It was, it was the main two things about it was, one, he's saved in Christ. He's totally new. He's a new creation. He's a child of God. Secondly, it meant he had to go tell the world, and he needed to go share who he was now in Christ and what it meant and what God actually did to make him a temple where God would choose to dwell, even though the highest heavens can't contain God. But he would choose to dwell inside of Raymond and inside of me and all those who who are God's children. You see, the prayer of Solomon was that we would wholeheartedly love God so much that even the enemies of God would turn and come pray at that temple and know that God is God and that they would have a chance to be returned from banishment or returned from exile and become one with God as well. So how's your temple? Is it defended against the thieves or the high places of this world that we leave in place to worship other things? Is it, is it a temple that when you go tell the world you actually have God dwelling in you because you're wholeheartedly there. If Israel ever left God and they said to another nation, hey, you should go to the temple, God wouldn't be there because they had turned away from God. When you tell the world about your temple and about your God who dwells inside of it, is God there? Are you wholeheartedly serving God? You see, that's the key. If we can do anything for you today, Uh, If you haven't given your life wholeheartedly to God so that he can dwell in you as a temple, if you have let your temple be overrun by other thieves or high places and you need prayers and you need to come back to God, um, if you just need to talk, whatever you need, give God your whole heart uh, and he will dwell inside you. Come now as we stand and sing. Hide me.